Hello, my name is Adam Pettinger and I'm with the uh, Nuclear and Applied Robotics Group. Today I'll be talking a little bit about our project, um, remote manipulation with a dual arm mobile robot. Uh, since this is a sort of a virtual tour, um, you don't get to see the whole team. So I thought I would introduce them just really quick. Uh, over here we have Akita, he's a first year PhD student uh, who came from the University of Oklahoma. I'm a second, a uh, year PhD student. I did my undergraduate here. Uh, we have Cassidy, who is not on the team anymore. She just graduated with her master's um, and left uh, in January. On the bottom, we have Pete and Caitlin, who are two of our undergraduate research assistants who do a lot of good work for us. And uh, this is Guy, who was a visiting scholar from Israel. And we show a lot of his work in our videos, but he is now back in Israel and no longer uh, with our group. Our project uh, works on one robot called VaultBot, which is shown here in the left image. It's a pretty simple base with four wheels um, on top of which we've mounted two six degree freedom arms. Uh, each of the arms has force torque sensor, has these cameras, grippers. Um, there's two more cameras in the back and this is kind of like a lighter that you might see on a new self-driving car. So this is a pretty decked out robot, um, including in Halloween theme in the picture. There's an exact copy of VaultBot called Ripley, which is shown on the right image, um, which lives in Perth, Australia. Uh, so this kind of shows you the back of the robot and, um, and the fact that, that there's a clone. Uh, Ripley is owned by Woodside, who's funding this project. And the idea is to go out into a liquid natural gas plant and do risky or dangerous or faraway tasks that we don't want a human to do. Um, so it's like if, a human had to do these tasks, they would have to potentially fly out on helicopter to the plant, uh, put on a bunch of PPE, a big suit, um, walk up to a mile away so they could look at some gauges and turn some valves. So we're hoping to do that with the robot so that they don't have to go through that whole process and you know, potentially expose themselves to, to danger. Um, an interesting aspect of this project is that we don't have like a set list of tasks we wanna perform. Uh, we kind of know some that we want to do, but uh, we, we need to be able to perform unknown tasks, uh, which will also allow us to, to use the robot in, in an emergency situation, um, kind of like the Fukushima reactor, if that something bad like that were to happen. So the main goal of our project is to do these tasks remotely. What you're looking at here is in the top left is a screen recording of Cassidy's uh, screen. She's controlling the robot from her living room in Houston, in Austin, sorry, in Austin, Texas. Um, the bottom right image is the actual robot in Australia driving from her commands. So this, this video represents uh, Cassidy doing these tasks, turning these valves and pushing this button um, on a robot in Australia from her living room, which is um, pretty incredible if you think about it. And this is the kind of work that we're trying to do is this pretty extreme remote, um, and make these tasks easier to do in such a remote setting like this. Some of the challenges, of course, there's gonna be some latency problems. Um, in the video I just showed, it could, it could be, there could be up to a second of time between when Cassidy inputted a command to the robot and when the robot received it. So this is like a big problem if you're doing very delicate tasks where even small motions can be too much. Um, additionally, there's a big situational awareness problem which we spend a lot of time on and I'll highlight in this video, which is there's a lot of different definitions for situational awareness in the research. I basically think of it as we need to give the operator, whoever is driving the robot, enough information to be able to do the test successfully without damaging the robot, without banging into other objects and stuff. Um, but we can't give them just everything we have because that's way too much and they won't know what to look at, they won't have enough screen space. Etc. So there's like some balancing act here between showing them not too much and not too little information. Additionally, um, task uncertainty. I already mentioned that we might not know exactly what the tasks are, but when we put these robots on a mobile base, um, now we don't even know where the object is exactly. So, so we drive the robot across the facility. We don't know exactly where the task we need to be doing is with respect to the robot arm. So this is, this is an important thing is where's the task and how do we do it? I briefly touched on showing the operator too much. Uh, even if we balance that just right, the operator still is responsible for a lot of different things and they have to drive the robot uh, safely and perform the task as fast as possible. So what we're trying to do is push a lot of decision-making, a lot of high-level controls 
all to the robot and try to automate as much of the process as possible so that hopefully in the end, the user doesn't have to say, turn the valve and the robot will know exactly what to do. It'll be able to find the valve and turn it, et cetera. And then of course, the last thing is, um, yeah, so if, if our robot goes out in the field and it fails or it breaks or something, then somebody, this time a robotics expert, has to get all dressed up in that PPE and go through the whole process and walk all the way out there to fix the robot and do the task that the robot was sent to complete. Um, so that's extremely annoying. And also, if the robot breaks in some kind of catastrophic way, it could be really bad for the, the natural gas plant. So to jump into situational awareness, um, what we've done on VaultBot and Ripley is put these two cameras, which I've highlighted on the left image. Uh, these are panospheric 4K cameras. And we put them back to back so that we can see a whole sphere. And then we stitch that sphere together in software, which is what you're looking at in the right video on our actual robot driver ground in our lab. So this is a good way to allow the operator to see anywhere they want, but not all at the same time. So that they can actually look at it on a screen like this and drag it around and, and look at, at anything like the roof or the, the back wall here. Um, and we've also implemented this in VR where, uh, so you can put on a VR helmet and then, and then look around like you're sort of in some kind of, uh, some kind of video game or something, which is, is one of the things we're looking at to improve the awareness of the environment for the, the robot driver. Additionally, we have these cameras, they're called RealSense cameras on each of the arms. You can see it here and here, and these are the cameras from earlier. Um, these cameras use multiple different small cameras inside of them to, to kind of stitch these multiple views together into a, into a view like, like humans see. So we have some information on the depth of the object, how far away the object we're looking at is from the camera. So these are, these are pretty good for being able to localize objects so that we can then turn the valve or do whatever. And some recent work that we've done here is to, to sort of, uh, if we're doing a task on, this grip, on the, the right arm here with the gripper, we can use the camera feed from that to look at the object, but we can also point the left arm's camera at the gripper and track it. So we can just get a lot of different angles on the one small thing that the robot is doing. And this brings us to uh, some of the problems I was mentioning early, earlier, which is how do we share all this information with whoever's driving the robot? Um, if we just give them all of it, they don't have enough screen space, they don't know where to look, it's too much. And it might not even be good data. So like, can we, can we add, can we overlay information? Can we add information to the raw camera feeds to make it more useful to them? Um, and then of course, overarching all this is they have to have enough awareness of their surroundings that they can actually complete the task. So I'll jump over to this video here. Um, this is some recent work where we've done kind of a full remote test run as Cassidy was preparing to do the driving, the Australian robot from her living room um, um, demo. So this is a ball bought in our lab in Austin and Cassidy in the top left driving it. Uh, what you're looking at along the bottom is all of, or some of the information that Cassidy is seeing on her screens. Uh, you can see that she actually has three monitors and there's, there's a lot going on. And, uh, um, and this, is, this is just us in about 10 minutes of real time. We've sped it up here, uh, going through driving up to some test valves, which are out of sight of Cassidy. And then she turns them with the robot. This bottom middle one is the panospheric camera. So you can see her moving it around to um, wherever she needs to look. Uh, the right bottom right one is the, uh, the gripper, like the camera mounted on the right gripper on the right arm. And you can see that uh, here, this is some of the work that Guy did before he went back to Israel, um, where we, we've taken the camera feeds and we've overlaid information. So this is kind of like your your car telling you how far away something is. Um, over here, we have all kinds of gripper information about uh, how the gripper is moving. Uh, if you notice, there's like a level, so you can see how level the gripper is. Um, there are force feedbacks. Uh, there's, 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 there's a little arrow that'll tell you how much force the robot is putting on the valve. And um, uh, we have a bunch of different parameters and, and moving capability that the driver can do. All that said, 
it's I means this is quite a capable robot, but also that the sort of the skill level of the the driver is is needs to be pretty high. So we can just skip through this a little bit and see that, um, you know, this isn't as fast as a human, of course, but in terms of robotics tasks, um, doing driving and doing three valves in 10 minutes is actually um, pretty speedy. So we can see that this is uh, pretty smooth uh, sailing on these, on these valve turns here. Cool. So the, the last topic that I'll focus on is, is automation and uncertainty. Um, I'll just point out that for our project here, we do not have a case uh, like the image seen on the right, where each robot is rigidly fixed and knows exactly where each car is going to be at a specific time. And it knows exactly the motion it has to do to be able to like slowly assemble this car. Um, and we don't have that at all. It's not even close. So we, we have it mounted on a mobile base. We don't know where the robot is in the world. Um, the tasks, we don't really know what um, to do. Sorry. We don't really know what to, um, we don't really, we don't necessarily know exactly how the robot needs to move the object to perform the task. Um, uh, for the valve turn that you just saw, um, we might not know exactly how far down the handle we've grabbed, which determines, of course, the arc that we need to, to do to turn it. Um, you know, we, we also don't know, how, it's hard to tell the robot if the task was completed successfully and um, how much force it's expected to take. And um, what if we don't know the task exactly, right? So if you think about those valve turns, um, if I just told you to turn the valve, you when you started, you wouldn't know if you had to turn it left or turn it right. Uh, right. So that's that's something that we have to take into account as well. So basically, there's a lot of stuff we don't know and we have to account for. Um, some of the recent work that we are doing, some of the recent work that we've done uh, to remedy this is, is things like change the control mode. So here you can see uh, this is me driving the robot with sort of a VR hand controller and obviously uh, I'm not doing it remotely and we've kind of removed the situational awareness aspect because I'm standing right next to the robot. But this allows a user to, to move the robot kind of like a 3D trackpad is what we call it. Very intuitive, um, pretty easy to do, um, even delicate tasks uh, with this control mode. Next, uh, we, we have a, a force torque sensor in the wrist of the, of the gripper so we can, we can make the robot arm respond to forces that it feels on the environment and make it kind of feel soft on the environment. And this helps us uh, react to uncertainty in the environment as you'll see in this grasp where we're not aligned at all on the gripper and uh, the, sorry, the gripper is not aligned at all on the valve and the, the sort of the compliance um, causes the robot to move and align itself automatically with the, with the, with the gr grasp. And this helps us do things like uh, automate the valve turns a little bit. So this is this is some good work that's still ongoing. Is how do we how do we automate all these tasks so that the robot knows not only how to do it but it can do it um, based on different grasps of the handle, etc. Um, and then of course we can put these together. And this is Katya using the VR hand controller with all of the compliance that we um, that we developed that I just talked about, where she can then. Um, teleoperate the robot to do this grasp uh, and kind of have this sloppy, this is hard to be very precise with the VR controller. So this is an intuitive, but a sloppy controller uh, that the, um, the, the force torque sensor and some fancy math behind it allows us to do, to do these tasks uh, in the face of uncertainty. So with that, um, I would like to just, just close. So we, we are, this project is trying to do tasks remotely, um, sometimes over a great distance, like from Texas to Australia. Uh, and we were looking at all kinds of how to help the user do those tasks, how to have the robot actually do it automatically, how to have the robot do it when it doesn't know exactly what the task is or where it is. Um, and this is, this is an area of a lot of ongoing research, but also a really cool project because we get to play with fun robots. And it's, it's not often um, even in robotics research that you get to drive somebody else's robot in their lab. So that's, that's an interesting um, challenge. 
Uh, I put uh, Dr. Pryor's uh, email here for generic NRG contact information if you need it. I'll also put my email and I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have about this project or our lab or, or even just grad school in general. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please refer to email me. Thanks.